All right, it's almost six o'clock. As people are joining us today, welcome. Um, we are really looking forward to having you here today and we're just gonna give it a few minutes to let everyone who registered join us. And while we're waiting, um, we'd love for you to put into the chat box where you're tuning in from. Um, we love to know, you know, are you local? Are you coming from another state um, or even international? Our last webinar, we had um, people from abroad. So let us know right there in the chat box. And also while we're waiting, um, we're gonna do just a few polls. And the first one we'd love to do um, that's going to pop up on your screen is what is your favorite ocean animal? And um, this is just because we love to hear what people care about, um, what interests you about the ocean. And so, you know, whales and dolphins, seals and sea lions, um, sharks particularly are my favorite, um, you know, and some people are, um, you know, love seabirds or octopus or kelp. So uh, let us know and we'll keep that up for, for just maybe 30 seconds or so. So if you're just joining, um, just let us know what favorite animal, ocean animal, um, which one you like best. All right, we will leave that open for just a few more seconds. All right, let's see what our results are. All right, so whales and dolphins, you know, I, I totally see why they are uh, amazing animals. Also octopus and invertebrates are pretty high. Great, well, that's really um, awesome information. Um, and so we're gonna do one more while we wait for people to join. And that is going to be, um, do you know what the Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary is? And so this is just, um, yes, you're familiar with the sanctuary. I've heard of it, but not really sure what it is or no, what, what is even a marine sanctuary? Um, so let us know kind of where, where you are with that. Um, it's a question we're always curious about um, being here, uh, working with the sanctuary so closely. And, um, and while you are completing that poll, Oh, it looks like we have a lot of local people tuning in. West Marin, somebody from Arizona, fantastic. Some other locals in Sausalito, Palo Alto. Great. I love to see people look coming in from different places around the country and the state. David from Berkeley. Oh, we have somebody from Florida tuning in. That's fantastic. Okay, um, just a few more seconds on this poll. Let's see what our results are. So it looks like, um, yes, most of you are familiar with the sanctuary. So that is that's very interesting. Thank you for completing that. All right, and so now um, it's about three minutes in, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Greater Farallons Association's uh, Kelp Climate and Coastal Resilience virtual event. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Elaine Chappell. Uh, I'm the Communications Manager for the Greater Farallons Association. Um, and today we will have two of our in-house experts joining us, our climate specialist and our geological oceanographer to tell us about some of the biggest issues facing our local ocean and the real concrete solutions that we're pursuing here at the association. And so along the way, we'll have a few trivia questions with prizes and a chance for our panelists to ask um, to answer some questions at the end of the hour. And so please feel free to ask your questions in the chat box throughout the event, and then we will um, try our best to get to all of them at the end. And if we can't get to all of them, we will send a follow up email to all attendees um, with answers to those questions. And so with that, I'd like to pass it to our board president, Jeff Lumens. Great. Thanks very much, Elaine, and welcome, everyone. It's great to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm the Jeff Lumens. I'm the board president and chair of the Greater Farallons Association, which is the nonprofit partner that supports the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. 
Uh, and I love the ocean. I mean, my family moved to Bolinas Lagoon, and we're going to hear more about Bolinas Lagoon later today, right on the shores of the marine sanctuary, because we love the ocean, and we wanted our daughter to literally grow up on it. So since she was four years old, she's been on and off floaties, kayaks, and paddle boards. She loves to swim in the lagoon. She especially likes to look for the sharks that come by the dock sometimes. We just had one last week. And don't worry, they're leopard sharks. They're not man eaters. Because we live near and even on it, marine conservation issues in the sanctuary are just super important to my family. So I'm really proud to be on the board of this organization, and not just because of what it does for the sanctuary, but because it's action-oriented in addressing the climate emergencies in our oceans today. One of my favorite examples of this is one we'll hear about in just a few minutes, the devastating loss of bulk kelp from California's coastal waters. And it's not my favorite example because of the devastating loss, but because of how this organization, the Greater Farallons Association, responded to it. Far faster than any other agency could, scientists from the Greater Farallons, and you'll hear from some today, jumped immediately on the problem and they're now actively finding real world solutions. And it's that roll up our sleeves and hey, let's solve the climate problems of our ocean attitude, ocean's attitude today, now, which is why I love to support this association. Now, for those of you who may not know, and it looks like we only had three people that hadn't heard of the sanctuary, but we'll, we'll let everyone know now, the Greater Farallons Association is the nonprofit partner of the National Marine Sanctuary. And here it is in front of you, 3,295 square miles of federally protected ocean, just off the north central California coast, stretching all the way from Point of Reno, way up north there, down to Monterey to the south. We focus our efforts on conserving the ocean and the coastal environment within the sanctuary for a number of reasons. First, the ecosystem within the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. It's one of the most productive and biodiverse marine ecosystems on the planet, one of only five major upwellings in the entire world. And we're so lucky to have it right here off our coast. It's home to at least 25 endangered or threatened marine species, including blue, gray, and humpback whales, elephant seals, Pacific white-sided dolphins, and stellar sea lions. It provides shelter and food for over a quarter million breeding seabirds, and it supports one of the most significant white shark populations on the planet. So it's a truly amazing underwater national park right here off the shores of San Francisco. And it's truly worth preserving for that marine life that lives within it, but not just for that. It's for all of us, those of us living along this coastline, and for the people that come to visit the sanctuary and to learn about it from all over the world. So we protect this amazing ecosystem through science, youth education, and community-based conservation, all supported by many dedicated volunteers. All this work is made possible through grant funding and from help from ocean advocates like you through private donations. Some of the most pressing issues facing our oceans today are related to climate change, and at Greater Fairlands Association, we're focused on studying these impacts and creating real world now solutions, some of which we're excited to tell you about today. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome two of our staff scientists, Sarah Hutto and Wendy Kordesh, your tour guides for this evening. Sarah and Wendy, if you can please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your backgrounds, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Jeff. Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm Sarah, and I coordinate the climate program for Greater Farallons Association. And as part of that, I provide climate information to our sanctuary managers. So we make sure that we are taking climate into account with how these resources are managed. Uh, my background is in marine ecology, and I've studied the great kelp forests off our coast here in California. But I've also been really fortunate to work on whale watching boats in the Gulf of Maine, to study lobster in the Florida Keys, and lots of other really fun things. Um, but now I live here in Santa Cruz with my family, and we enjoy recreating on the coast. Um, and you can see I'm jump roping some kelp there as my dog Brisby looks on. <laughs> All right, Wendy, your turn. Oh, Brisby, I've met Brisby in meetings virtually. <laughs> I love that photo of you in your red um, safety <laughs> suit there. Um, but <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Wendy. I'm the geological oceanographer for the association. And admittedly, that's a mouthful. But um, it just means that I have a background in sediment and in seawater. 
And I'm also at the association, the outreach specialist for the Seabird Protection Network. Um, and personally, as you can see in the photos there, I'll take any excuse to get in the water. Um, mostly I swim with the Dolphin Club, but over the past year, I've learned how to go crabbing. And um, <laughs> uh, if you learn, you know, if you time it. That's an awesome picture, Wendy. <laughs> uh, that is the crowning glory right there. But um, if you time it right, you can get in the water to go for a swim. You drop the trap, go for a swim, pick it up right at sunset, uh, and then make it home with Dungeness crabs in time for dinner. It's like a real triumph, um, but it's, it's so fun. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, it's a reminder of what the ocean really can give us. Um, but I grew up in the Bay Area and it's really a personal honor to protect the beaches and coasts that I grew up visiting when I was younger. Um, so without further ado, uh, Sarah, are you ready to dive in? Let's do it, Wendy. Okay. Um, well, as we said, we're going to visit some special places in the sanctuary. There's five of them listed here. And all of them are also experiencing climate impacts. So we'll tell you about the five solutions that we're pursuing to protect them. And Sarah and my goal today is really to show you that if you use climate smart actions, um, there's plenty of room for hope with climate change. So we'll show you why today. All right, our first stop you can see there is the kelp forest. So we start up in Northern California. Okay, so kelp forests, uh, they're beautiful. They're hidden just beneath the surface and they're teeming with life. Uh, kelp forests are like the redwoods of the sea. Um, and you know their, their structure really forms the whole backbone of the ecosystem, provides a ton of benefits to wildlife like seals and sea lions who use these habitats as nurseries. Their kelp forests are like big playgrounds for their um, pups. Big, big animals like gray whales you can see there use these habitats um, for shelter. And even smaller animals like rockfish in the middle or tiny colorful nudibranchs, which are sea slugs. Uh, to starfish and passing jellyfish, the, the kelp forest is really important to our coastal wildlife. And not only that, Wendy, but they're really, really important to people and they provide a lot of benefits. Not only are they really fun to explore on uh, if you're free diving or on scuba and if you have a really thick wetsuit and you can brave those chilly waters, it's really worth it because it's like you're swimming among giants. Um, but they also support a bunch of local communities who fish sustainably here in California. In fact, um, entire economies on the North Coast rely on kelp dependent fisheries. And on top of all these benefits, kelp forests can actually help us in our fight against climate change. Not only do they help dampen wave energy from increasing storm activity, reducing erosion on the shoreline, but kelp also absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere removing that heat trapping greenhouse gas through photosynthesis and locking it away. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that, that is really amazing. And um, I've come to appreciate how, how you know, wild and important that is. Um, and I've also you know, come to learn that the kelp forests have almost entirely disappeared in Northern California, which is, which is really sad. Um, we've lost over 95% of the bull kelp forest in the region. And last mm -hmm. year, I happened to go diving in Mendocino with my family, and um, we saw an urchin baron. I didn't didn't really fully understand until I saw it firsthand. You know, you're swimming along, and it's kind of boring. I hate to say it, it was so fun, but there wasn't really any fish. And you just see, you know, urchin, 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 and not a lot of other animals. Um, so, you know, I was kind of checking my watch to see how long we'd been down there. So. Wendy, how did all this kelp loss happen? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, and so it is complicated, right? If you think of an ecosystem and the web of connections you have, but um, kind of boiled it down here to, um, you know, what you can think of as an ecological one-two punch. Um, and <laughs> it's cheesy, but it's a good way to understand it. So first punch, <laughs> climate change, right? There's this blob here, it's, a, it's an underwater heat wave and it spread across the Pacific in 2015 and made right, water too hot and also made the water too low in nutrients for kelp to grow on the coast. So first punch, mm -hmm. climate change. Second punch, and this is how complicated and connected our ecosystems are, right? The second time, 
was disease. So uh, sea star wasting disease spread and caused a bunch of sea stars to die. Right. Mm. So that makes sense. But why does that matter to kelp? Um, well, sea stars eat purple urchins. So all of a sudden, purple urchins had no predators. They went, you know, bonanza on the coast, and they do what they do. Best. <laughs> <laughs> they ate all the kelp, you know, they, they're voracious eaters and this is what they do. And they ate through it along hundreds of miles of coast. Um, so, you know, combined the blob, the disease, it was a knockout for kelp forests. And, you know, if you yeah. think of cutting down a redwood forest, think of all the cascading impacts that would have on wildlife. You know, this picture shows here a lot of urchins and not much else, sadly. Yeah, and it's it's really unprecedented. I think a lot of our kelp scientists um, that have been working here have been pretty shocked at the scale of this loss. Well, at Greater Fairlands Association, bringing these kelp forests back is a huge priority. So with many strong partnerships, the association and the sanctuary have already taken critical steps to lay the groundwork for eventual recovery of bull kelp along the sanctuary coastline. We've developed a kelp recovery plan and mobilized a network of partners that includes tribal partners and residents of the coastal communities along the North Coast that are most affected by this kelp loss. We've spent the past two years mapping kelp forest canopy using drones, which is a really cool use of that technology. In fact, this is the largest drone mapping project ever completed in California. And so using this information, we've been able to identify ideal locations along the shore for the next critical step, which is restoration of these kelp forests. Okay. I don't work on kelp. And when you say restoring, you know, that's it's really easy. We restore the kelp on the forest, you know, like in the ocean, how do we do that, you know? Yeah, it's not easy. It's not like just going out there and planting a bunch of little uh, baby plants. Um, and you can't replant the whole coastline, right? That would be crazy. But you can strategically remove urchins from key sites, giving kelp the chance to grow back. And we're even exploring options with local researchers to actually plant baby kelps to jumpstart recovery of the population in those spaces that have been cleared of urchins. So by targeting key recovery sites for restoration, our big aim is to establish like a network of healthy kelp oases along the coast that can really act as starter gardens for surrounding areas, just giving kelp a fighting chance at coastwide recovery. So, you know, it's clear to all of us that our nearshore ecosystem is really out of balance and we have to work together to tip the scales back in favor of the diverse and productive kelp forests. But this work takes huge investment, both in people power and financial resources. So we are currently seeking funding to take these next critical steps that are needed to ensure that kelp can persist into the future in California. And now we're going to move to shallower waters and explore the coast first with Wendy. All right. Um, and thank you, I like starter garden is a good phrase for, um, for thinking about that. And that's how we do it on land, right? Um, but here we are at the coast, right? This is definitely my favorite stop um, because I like thinking about the coast and how it works, but we're starting really zoomed out here at um, Point Reyes. And you can see, you know, this is juts out way into the ocean. We have a bunch of bays. We have some linear features here. You know, why does our coast look like this here? It doesn't look like this anywhere else along. Um, you know, the Western United States. And if you look really carefully, you might have spotted this San Andreas Fault. Of course it's the fault. Ah, uh, there it is. <laughs> That's the, in most of California, if you think, why is that there? The answer is the fault. Um, but here it is. And um, the land on the whole left side, right, the Western side is actually from Southern California. And it's been dragged North over millions of years. Right, so Point Reyes, wow. the dig ahead, the rocks there are really from SoCal, just visiting up north. Um, they're on their way. And if you think that's cheesy, Sarah. Okay, I have a fun fact for you. Okay, when did you last All cut right, them? let's hear it. What? Fingernails, when did you last cut them? My fingernails, um, maybe a week ago. Why do you care, Wendy? Yeah, and what does that have to do with the Point Reyes? 
this San Andreas fault, like this whole piece of land on the left-hand side moves north at the same rate that your fingernails grow, right? It's centimeters. Oh. You're clipping your nails every week or every couple of weeks. That's, it's not nothing, huh. right? So it's pretty amazing. It's my favorite fun fact. Um, but that's a good you know, one. The point is not just wow you with cool facts about geology, but um, <laughs> to make a broader point, the coast isn't as stationary as we think it is, right? It's not permanent. Um, these areas are moving all the time and you just have to know what to look for. Um, but if we zoom in on Bodega Bay, I'll show you where our coast and how our coast is changing on human time scales. Um, so here's a really cool photo. This is in Bodega Bay at, um, in the foreground you see Doran Beach and a beautiful beach. Uh, then you see the harbor behind it and then those cliffs from SoCal in the background. And you know, you might first be eyeing that sweet campground on the dunes. I'm headed to camping soon myself. Um, you might be spotting that harbor with all those boats. Uh, but when I look at this as a geologist, I see something totally different. You know, I see sand on the beach and mud in those wetlands and sediment and dune and wetland plants holding all the shoreline together. And I see lots of movement. May not seem like it, um, but sand flows, sediment moves on our coast. It's not just, uh, you know, sand doesn't just lounge on the beach in the summer waiting for us to hang out on it. Um, <laughs> it, it flows down the coast, like, like water and with water. Um, so sand uh, comes from Sierra Nevada granite. Most sand in California is crunched up in those big rocks in the Sierras and it flows downstream in rivers and then trickling down into small streams. And eventually it makes its way to the shoreline and it piles up on our beaches, but it doesn't stop there. It keeps flowing down shore because we have waves, we have currents, uh, winter storms. So our coast changes size with the seasons. It grows in the summer when there's no storms and it erodes in the winter and that's natural, but the beach in general at our coast is a very, very dynamic place with a lot of movement. I don't think most people know that. No, I don't think most people know that. That's so cool. And I love that visual there too. It's really helpful. So I understand that these things are changing seasonally and even year to year, but also our beaches and coasts are facing new kind of unprecedented changes. And that's the long-term ongoing persistent impacts due to climate change. So for example, we know that sea levels have risen by around nine inches in the last 150 years. And scientists are actually predicting another two to six feet before the end of the century, which is so crazy to imagine. And we Californians really like to live by the water. Over 70% of us live in coastal counties, you and me included. Yep. Um, but in addition to people, marine animals also need the coast to rest and reproduce and to raise their young. And sea level rise is causing flooding and erosion of our beaches and coastlines. And because most of them are backed by roads, communities, entire cities, our shoreline habitats are getting squeezed into much narrower spaces. And in some cases, they're being pinched out completely. Like this photo here, the waves are just crashing up on riprap. There's no natural habitat there at all anymore. Um, that's not good for us or marine wildlife. And I'm kind of painting a bleak picture, but there's actually a lot we can do about this. A lot of this is actually in our control. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a good point. And this is kind of a bleak picture. Um, but right, the most climate smart thing we can do right now is save sand, right? It's that simple. Um, in California, especially when you grow up here, you know, we all know you need to conserve water. It's a precious resource. It's in short supply. I remember as a kid, you know, you didn't wash your car if it wasn't sitting on your lawn to reuse the water. Um, but after water, here's a mind blowing fact for you. Sand is the number two, like the second most consumed natural resource on the planet. Wow. Right? Water, it's number two. It's, that's really mind blowing. Um, but if you, this picture is a good, good uh, illustration of this. So if you look at our cities, every single road and every house and every building in that picture here is made out of concrete. And what's concrete made out of? Sand. Oh, sand. Yeah. And on top of that, and especially here in Silicon Valley, how many computers are in every single one of those houses, right? Uh, sil every computer has silicon chips, which are also made from sand. 
Um, and wow. then, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And if you really, especially here in this picture, the entire Western half of San Francisco is built on top of sand dunes, right? All of Ocean Beach used to be, that whole half of the city used to be big rolling dunes. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Did you, did you know we rely on sand so much, Sarah? You know what? I never thought about it, Wendy. I'm sorry. I know you're a sand and sediment nerd. Um, I you hadn't thought about it before, but yeah. I pretty much, I need it just as much as a seal needs it to lay on the beach. That is You've convinced me. My ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing you on the beach now with the seals. Um, yeah, we need it, right? Every, whether we realize it or not, whether we live on the coast or not, we need sand, we need beach sand um, in our daily lives. So the, that is you know, very much the case, but the problem is right now, extra sand mostly goes to the trash dump. You know, literally the landfill is where this ends up and sand is blown onto roads on the highway one, you see that a lot. Um, it's dug up during construction on the coast and then it's taken straight to the dump. I didn't, we, we wouldn't really do that with water. Um, it's sand to be recycled. And on top of that, we can use sand, reuse it even, to help habitats take root against sea level rise, right? And if we go back to Bodega here, we have great ideas about how to save sand in this location and a ton of other ones in the sanctuary. Um, but so this channel here, you can see to get in the harbor, to get to that you know, protected harbor, there's a navigational channel. And mm. because sand builds up in harbors, you know, comes in through the streams, you have to dredge that channel in order for it to be navigable. And it's, it's one of the only harbors on the coast. It's really important, we need it. But historically, that sand that's been dredged is dumped far at sea. We didn't think about it as something we need to reuse. There's systems, it's cheaper, you put it out of sea, it doesn't harm anything to put sand there. But if it's clean and it's the right match, sand could be recycled right here on Doran Beach, right? And it could help the beach and those dunes yeah. and the dune habitat and those wetlands adapt to sea level rise, right? It's a, it's a nice solution here. It's a pretty, pretty composed uh, system and it's a great example of what we're doing. So. Our solution here is, you know, we've partnered with the sanctuary uh, to get the word out. You know, the number one thing is to talk about this more, let agencies know, project planners, construction site, all over the North Central California coast to get people to work together to save that sand. And we have a special, <laughs> special thing we're doing next with this. So um, how are we gonna save that sand? Well, we wanna create the first online dating platform for sand. That's the easy oh, thing to <laughs> I love this stuff. Okay, but that's what it is, right? If you're looking for nice clean sand for you know, a nice walk on the beach, um, you know, we can match make you with a dredging project <laughs> that lives nearby, right? It's, it's really is about matchmaking and that's what, we just need to help make those connections. Um, you're gonna love this one, Sarah. So you know, looking for the love of your life, that's hard. <laughs> but finding sand, it really shouldn't be. <laughs> oh, that's too much, Wendy. <laughs> it's not gonna Great look idea, like though. Steph, we'll have to think of a fun name, but um, it's, it's matchmaking and it's something, right? There's no, there's no platform for this that currently exists. So jokes aside, um, this is really important and it's important now. Um, last year, alone there was a couple opportunities that came up you know we got everyone really got calls about these sources of sand that maybe we could reuse and ultimately there was no one who could act fast enough to save mm. it so we sort of yeah. thought like well why can't that be me you know why can't we do that um so we're doing it uh you know sand is precious it can be reused in an environmentally friendly way on the coast near our homes and we should be making that happen so we are um, and, you know, I talked a lot about how sand can be used. We're going to go a little bit deeper into that in our next spot in wetlands by visiting the Linus Lagoon. Cool. Yeah. Next spot are coastal wetlands. These are calm, shallow water habitats that we can find in places like Tomales Bay and here, Bolinas Lagoon, both of which are in the sanctuary. Now, Bolinas Lagoon is located at the southern part of Point Reyes, and it's considered a tidal estuary. That just means that it's partially enclosed with an open connection to the ocean on one side that you can see there on the left. 
as well as um, streams that are flowing into it um, all around kind of on the other sides. And that creates brackish water in the lagoon, which is a mix of salt and fresh. And because of that, Bolinas Lagoon is a really special and unique estuary, so fun to visit. It supports wetlands, attracts a ton of birds, and provides critical habitat for a number of different animals. Yep, and I've got your animals here in the lagoon. Um, so the lagoon's a pupping ground for harbor seals, and they're really cute. It's a calm water habitat for leopard sharks and bat rays. Like Jeff mentioned, he spotted a leopard shark last week. Uh, it's also a major stopover for migrating birds and residents, bir resident birds who, who need the lagoon to eat and to rest on their long journeys. And this picture here is one of my favorite memories of Sarah and I out in Belize doing some field work for sediment. And we're trying to focus, you know, doing diligently, doing our work and looking at sediment and, you know, a couple hundred yards offshore these pelicans are just slamming into the water and they, they dive at 40 miles an hour and the noise they make. And if you remember that, Sarah, just slam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing. There was so much activity that day. Yeah. And it was, a, it's a real, you've sort of heard of that and not really seen it firsthand until then, but uh, it's amazing. But um, here, you know, you can see what, a, what habitat it is and in its natural state, the lagoon, the wetlands in the lagoon have this, gradually sloping healthy shoreline right and the important thing here is it provides a smooth transition from the water to the mud flat to the marsh to the upland sandy habitat right that smooth transition it uh, firstly is a huge bird buffet there's a ton of worms and crabs when we were looking at sediment out there you kind of have to avoid them it's a huge food source and secondly uh, birds and other animals they can't only live in the water they need land to nest and rest and so this area is really important to them and gives them the space to do that that's right but one thing we've noticed in the lagoon that as climate impacts worsen stressors like sea level rise and storm surge and even more extreme precipitation events are causing big changes uh, to the shoreline and in fact the majority of the south end of Bolinas lagoon has already been impacted by erosion creating a really steep drop off that you can see um, my colleague Kate and I are measuring in this photo and we might be smiling, but this drop off is not good to see as it's really replaced that healthy, gradually sloping shoreline that supports all the diverse plants and animals in the lagoon. And so this drop off has basically squeezed out any feeding and resting areas for wildlife. There is no bird buffet or fish nursery available here any longer. Um, and plus, losing wetland habitat to erosion also means we lose valuable carbon storage. And just as I mentioned briefly earlier for kelp, marsh plants absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere where it would otherwise be contributing to global warming. And they lock that carbon away for centuries in the mud underneath. And I've actually just finished some really exciting calculations, Wendy, that tell us that the You're sanctuary, <laughs> yeah, yeah, click, click, click. The sanctuary has about one and a half square miles of salt marsh mud that currently stores up to 420,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. If that mud were to be disturbed by maybe building a road or something, then it would be equivalent to adding 100,000 more vehicles to the road for an entire year or burning 47 million gallons of gasoline. So protecting these marshes keeps those dangerous greenhouse gases in the ground and it ensures that these marsh plants can continue to absorb and store away that carbon year after year after year. So it's not only important to protect this lagoon because so many animals depend on it, it's also a big part of the climate change solution. And our solution here is to really help these wetland habitats take root against sea level rise. And we mean that pretty literally, don't we, Wendy? Yes, we do. Um, and I like that phrase, take root against sea level rise, um, because we're planning to use a technique called living shorelines, right? So that's a nice sound. Um, but what that technique is, is using sand, the ever important sand, and plants and other natural materials to stabilize the coast. And it sounds too easy, but what, you know, what do I mean? What does that, what does that uh, actually do? How does it work? Um, well, first of all, marsh roots 
hold the shoreline together, right? Just by just by having roots into the mud. And then vegetation, like the stalks that stick out of the water, they trap sediment. So there's all this, you know, mud particles in the water. And when they hit the stalks, they fall out. So marshes are one of the only habitats that can grow on their own, right? They accumulate sediment that nowhere else does that. And you need calm water habitats for this to happen. Um, but what you can do is help that along, right? You can add sand, you can manage the plants and use native plants, and those are better at holding together the shoreline. Uh, but these are hugely beneficial and they have, um, you know, longer lasting time scales. They're easier and cheaper to maintain because they're made out of plants and sand. And they're, of course, more environmentally friendly. If you look at the difference between the pictures here, there's a lot more animals on the left um, because we haven't pinched that habitat, right? The picture on the right is a great example of accidentally pinching off this gently sloping shoreline that the animals really need to eat and to, you know, rest mm -hmm. on. But that's our plan for the south end of the lagoon, right? That, that drop-off sort of looks like what Sarah, you know, was pictured next to. But what we want to do is transform the unhealthy eroding shoreline into a gently sloping bird buffet again like this you know and and it also offers an escape ramp out of the water for wildlife when sea levels rise so you know this is really our target a nice gently sloping shoreline and if you know i think the question we get a lot with living shorelines is what do they look like in the end but the whole goal of a living shoreline is you don't notice them right they just look like nature but but really they've been carefully designed to stabilize the shoreline and that's why they're so cool um, but so we're working on this in the south end We're right now we're working with partners who kind of doing the planning of assessing the scale and scope of the living shoreline and we hope to get started soon. Um, and if you're interested in living shorelines or the, on the concept and how they're used or you want to get hands on volunteering out there it's so fun, uh, you should definitely go check it out, you can go to our website and we'll put that in the chat right there Olivia put that in there for everyone. Yeah, I would definitely get out there if you can. It's it's so beautiful. And I know many of you would probably want to get your hands dirty out there in the lagoon. Um, okay, we're going to leave the coast and we're going to journey far offshore to the Farallon Islands, also known as the Devil's Teeth. These are 27 miles off the San Francisco coast, as you can see in that lovely animated Google map. And we have northern elephant seals, California sea lions, and stellar sea lions, which are the largest of the sea lions, using these rugged island cliffs for hauling out and breeding and raising their young pups. And of course, the waters around the Farallon Islands within the sanctuary are well known for attracting one of the largest populations of white sharks in the world. And Wendy, I know you're excited to talk about this. Last but not least, the islands support Seabirds. <laughs> Let me jump in there. Seabirds. Yeah. I like rocks. Set me up. I like my seabirds. <laughs> um, yeah. And the Farallons, seabirds, that's really, you know, white sharks are cool, but the seabirds here are amazing. Um, the islands are home to the largest population of breeding seabirds in the entire contiguous United States, right? So wow. Outside of Alaska and Hawaii. This is the largest population of breeding seabirds. There's a quarter million of them who live on the islands. And the islands aren't that big, right? But it's nope. packed. Uh, this is like a one big bird B and B. We like to say um, that, right? B and Bs offer a good night's rest, and that does that on these jagged, rocky cliffs. And they also give you breakfast. But the food-rich water offshore here is is really bountiful and full of food, right? That's really why all those animals you listed are here on the coast. They're here for the food, you know, the seafood. And, you know, it's the same seafood we all enjoy in California too. You know, I've been fishing out there. There's a ton of fish. It's, it's really food rich. But if you look at the two birds on the top here, on the right are sooty shearwaters. And they fly here by the hundreds of thousands all the way from New Zealand. Right? It just sounds wild, but they make that journey wow. for food. You know, they, they come all the way across our ocean and the same with black-footed shearwaters, but they fly here all the way from Hawaii, right? To eat our calamari and our after waters. Um, but it's just wild to me that every year they make that migration to our coast, to our waters for the food. Wow. Wendy, do any birds like nest on the, or live on the islands year round or use them year round? 
Do they? <laughs> yes. My favorite. I don't know. I'm not a bird person. Tell me. <laughs> I, they do. They do. My favorite ones, in fact. <laughs> Um, so these are common murs and they're, you know, I love this dapper looking seaver. They stand upright. They look like penguins. They're not, um, but they really look like them. And it's not, you wouldn't think this kind of bird looks so cool. It lives so close to our shore, but 200,000 of them live on the Farallons. You know, there's only a quarter million there. Most of them are common murs. And you can see they um, pack really, really close together in the top left photo. That's how they nest and they breed like that packed wing to wing uh, really close together. And they don't uh, make nests. They bounce them on their feet, which coincidentally is like a penguin, but um, their eggs are way cooler. They're these turquoise eggs, right? Balance on their feet. And if you've been watching that mesmerizing video below, they're really incredible swimmers. Maybe that's why I like them so much. Um, but right, look how agile they are. They're underwater torpedoes, swimming around, darting and diving. And they're, they're doing that, they're swimming for food. So they, they're really good at fishing and catching water underwater, catching fish underwater. Um, and the neatest thing about them, them um, swimming is that they're not using their feet, right? They're flapping oh, yeah. their wings. So they're really like flying underwater. It's a really interesting adaptation. Uh, but speaking of common birds, we have our very first trivia question. And uh, it has to be here because the common mars are so cool. But we have some great prizes for you. If we show the shirts. We have these cool shirts. You can choose which one. We've got all the sizes. But get your typing fingers ready for our trivia question. We're going to take the first correct answer. So if you get your chat box ready, and we have some people um, who will pick our very, oh no, I'll pick it, <laughs> the, the winner. Uh, but we're going to reveal the question. So if you're ready, we'll count down in three, two, one, go. How deep is the deepest a common mer has ever been recorded diving? Oh, we have some really quick answers. Ooh, the answers are it. coming in. Oh my gosh, can your eyes work that fast? No, I have 63 new messages. <laughs> you guys are fast typers. Okay, yeah, we've are. got 100, we've got 59, we've got... 600, we've got 1,000, 250. 250, 300. Nobody gets in fathoms. <laughs> That's good. Yes, please, no fathoms. Okay, well, the first person to get, nobody got it exactly. What's the closest we take? Closest, yep. Just let well, people keep first guessing. Closest, first closest is, I saw it, and now I'm sorry, scrolling. Oh, oh, there's one. You read it, Sarah. If somebody got it, you read it. Okay, someone guessed 550 feet. Calmly exactly. chew up. I'm sorry, I'm probably not saying your name very well, but you are our winner, 550 feet. I don't think I saw a 550 before that one. Calmly. Congratulations. Calmly. Calmly. Thank you. you a nice shirt. And Sarah, Sarah and I both love that shirt on the left. It's a mashup of all their animals. Awesome. Yeah, that's, really cool. that's the one I would choose. Congratulations, Calmly. Yeah, congrats. And we'll be in we touch. Another, we'll be in touch with you via message. And we have another <laughs> trivia question coming up. So so get your typing fingers. You ready? ready. <laughs> be ready. Well, Wendy, these birds are so cool, but you know, life for a seabird and MERS in particular is not easy. In fact, they have to deal with a lot of changes, including those caused by climate change. And as another consequence of that warm water blob that you told us about earlier. An estimated 62,000 dead or dying common murs washed ashore on beaches from California to Alaska. But scientists think that it could have been as many as 1 million birds that died during that time. And all of this mortality was really a result of that warm, nutrient-poor water that caused a huge decline in the food that the murs like most, which are sardines and anchovies. So when animals are impacted by large scale changes like this, it's really essential that while we work to combat the cause, which is global climate change, we also have to take immediate steps to ensure that they don't face any additional impacts from people that could even do more harm. And you had mentioned these birds nest really densely packed together. And that's a problem when they get startled by humans that get too close in loud boats or low flying planes they will flush the area and they can dislodge the eggs or their chicks, causing them to fall off the cliffs or leaving them vulnerable to predators like this bald eagle. In this picture, you can see the bald eagle swooping in and you can see that gull with a 
bright blue myrrh egg in its mouth. Um, and because myrrhs lay just like one egg a year, the single disturbance could wipe out a whole generation in one fell swoop. Yeah, and that I do love that photo. We were looking at that egg in the mouth earlier, and it, I think you can just see the chaos happening, right? Mm. The, the trampling and the it's pretty sad. Um, but you know, the one climate solution, as you said, is to reduce human stressors. And so that's right. That's what the Seabird Protection Network does. And we partner with recreational pilots, with small plane pilots on the coast, and boaters and kayakers. And we work to reduce human caused stress to, to seabird breeding areas. And it's really their breeding areas, like the Farallons, that matter so much because if you really want to protect a species, you have to protect the place it reproduces, right? If they are going to reproduce, they didn't have the space and the and the you know quiet that they need to do that. Um, but what the Seabird Protection Network does is we use data on where disturbances are, and then we get the message out exactly where it matters most. You know, is it the Fairlands? Is it Devil Slide or Point Reyes? We we target specific areas and target audiences because mostly they just don't know that this is happening. And um, mm -hmm. one example of a really fun one we did last year is we created a virtual tour of the coast from the sky for pilots and you know a thousand pilots came it, wow you know, watching that number tick up it was really nerve-wracking but um you know creating engaging content that also gives people safety messages and lets them know what's happening on the coast and how they can help it really works right we partner with people um, and this is important work and we'll continue to look for ways to protect seabirds in the sanctuary that's fantastic, Wendy. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, okay, we're gonna move to our last stop. We're gonna keep moving offshore to the open ocean off the coast of California, which to us, it may look kind of quiet and boring at the surface, but the ocean is chock full of life. And just like the seabirds that we learned about, migrating animals like all the ones pictured here come from all over the world to feed in these productive waters. As you can see in all these little images down at the bottom of the slide, these are tracks from tagged animals. Um, and we can see how they come from all over to visit California, which is highlighted in each map. It's really incredible. So why is our water so rich in food for animals? And it's actually, it's the same reason why our coastal waters don't look like the tropics. They're murky, right? right. Um, sometimes you might get a good dive day in a kelp forest that's pretty clear, but for the most part, these waters are pretty murky and that's because they're packed with nutrients, which is thanks to a process called upwelling. Some of you might be familiar, but we'll go through the basics. Along the west coast of the United States and other continents like South America and Africa, Northerly winds cause sea surface waters to be pushed offshore. And as this surface water moves offshore, cold nutrient rich water from below is kind of drawn up like a vacuum in order to replace that water that's pushed off. And you're probably feeling these winds recently. It is springtime, which is when we feel these upwelling winds. And recently I've been at the beach with my kids and when they start complaining to me about how cold it is, I remind them, these winds are super important because they feed all the animals and they keep the ocean life off our coast so rich from the teeny tiny plankton all the way up to the largest animals on the planet, the whales. God, Sarah, how that said like a true scientist. <laughs> how does that how does that work out for you? <laughs> oh, yeah, my kids hate it. They roll their eyes at me. Not again, mom. Jeez. Well, but it's that's... true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, as you can see, I love that. Um, as you can see, the whales here, right? Blue whales, uh, uh, all sorts of whales are really attracted to our coast because of upwelling, right? That's why they're here. And blue whales on the left there, those are the biggest animals that have ever lived. Um, and speaking of, we've got whale trivia for you. So <gasps> trivia for time! To win a t shirt. <laughs> yeah, so. We've got another guessing game for you. Same deal, first correct answer in the chat box will win a t-shirt and you can choose which one and choose which size. But our question is about whales and we're gonna reveal it in three, two, one, go. Oh, there's your shirt. Next slide. Okay, question. <laughs> How much can the heart of a blue whale weigh? 
Oh, wow. In pounds, please, in pounds. That's a tricky. conversion. Oh, gosh. oh, in pounds. Pounds, please. Pounds. <laughs> we can't convert that fast. All right. Oh, we my gosh. These are coming in so fast. I don't even. 60, 55, 120. Wow. Oh, people there. are really good at guessing. I see. There's some close ones. I don't know. Where do we cut it off? The first one is M. And did anybody guess exactly right? I don't think so, but I saw some close ones. I see M W I T T E. There's no name there. M wit, perhaps guessed 500. And that's the Ooh. first closest one I see. Yep. Oh, I we think you're, I think that's good. That yep. came in before all the 400s. Yeah. All right. Well, M that's your name. M witty wit. Uh, please write back and we'll get you oh. your sweet t-shirt. Witty like kitty. All right, congratulations. Congrats, all right, those are, those are some great shirts. We both love them. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, so you know, from the biggest animal, we go to the smallest and there's really cool videos here, but right, we have tons of tiny microscopic plants and animals out in the open ocean and they're really beautiful and they're notoriously hard to photograph. I've tried and my photos stink. Um, and these are amazing. And we have a wonderful volunteer, Janai, who is uh, pictured there sitting in our visitor center on Chrissy Field. And you have to check out her YouTube and her Instagram. Um, she's really oh, I will. Yeah. That I looks awesome. Instagram. They're they're amazing. These are her photos and they're 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 unbelievable um, and beautiful. Yeah, they look like creatures from outer space, right? They look like space aliens. <laughs> Yeah, they do. Um, I like that. That one on the left is a copepod, pod and that, that does kind of look like one. Um, I also, I heard rumor that the, have you seen the movie Predator? That's old no, movie. that's not my, that's not my jam, Wendy. Here, I haven't seen it, but I know what the, the aliens look like. The movie Predator was inspired by um, deep sea plankton because they do. Whoa. Like so you're exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> cool, cool. Um, but okay, they're not just, scary or, or beautiful or both, um, but they are really important to our coast. And, and now you just humor me here, Sarah and everyone at home, take two okay. deep breaths with me. It's really important. Okay. Ready? One breath in and out. And the second one in. I love it. And out. I'm not doing yoga here. Okay. Why are we doing that? <laughs> yeah, I've got all sorts of, I can get you to do all sorts of I mean, it was nice, but... <laughs> I've been being calming, um, you know, that whole second breath comes from oxygen that was produced by plankton in the ocean, right? So there's tons of, forget trees on land. No, don't forget them. But most of the oxygen, 70% of the oxygen we breathe comes from phytoplankton or tiny plants, right? It's, most of it comes from the ocean. And you can see the, the plankton that has green in it. That's a picture of a phytoplankton. They're really amazing. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, I know that the open ocean provides a lot for us, but did you know that whales and plankton, the biggest and the smallest, can actually help us combat climate change? They actually store and sequester carbon. So phytoplankton, we know there's these tiny microscopic plants and they're photosynthesizers, as you just mentioned, they create all this oxygen for us. So while they're creating all that oxygen, they're absorbing carbon dioxide just like salt marsh and kelp. And then they sequester or lock away that carbon permanently when they die and sink to the deep sea. Yes, they're small, but there are so many of them out there that globally, get this, phytoplankton capture 37 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. That's equivalent to almost half of our global emissions from human activities, Total. 40%, almost half, yeah just from the phytoplankton doing their thing. It's really amazing. And to bring this full circle back to the whales, whales actually help phytoplankton do this. Yes, you are looking at exactly what you are hoping that is not. <laughs> Whale poop is like fertilizer for phytoplankton. By releasing nutrients in their poop, that is critical and often in limited supply for phytoplankton to grow, Whales actually increase the amount of carbon that's taken up and eventually stored for long time periods. Wow. Cool, huh? Okay. I've got one. I've got one for you, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> that um, that call of nature 
is certainly a force of nature. <laughs> oh, Wendy, how long have you been waiting to say that? All day, all day. <laughs> all day, yeah, not surprised. Well, in addition to that messy process, whales and other large marine animals themselves are huge carbon tanks just due to their large body size. So when they die in the open ocean, most of them fall to the deep sea, taking that carbon with them. That carbon is then stored in the mucky ooze at the bottom forever. And we've actually calculated just recently, more calculating happening, that just five whale species that feed in the sanctuary export over 9,000 tons of carbon dioxide every year, just through dying and sinking to the bottom. This is equivalent to removing over 2,000 cars from the road every year. And what I find most interesting is that we could double, more than double, that amount of carbon that is sequestered if we could fully restore the populations of humpback and fin whales on our coast to the, si the population sizes they were before whaling occurred. So basically, in a nutshell, the more whales you have in the ocean means there's more fertilizer for phytoplankton and there's more carbon taken to the deep sea on a yearly basis. Oh, that's, that's really amazing. And now I have some some sad news. Those are really all the more reason to protect whales. And many of them on the coast, you know, by us are endangered and facing challenges, you know, really to do with humans, like many of the animals we're talking about today. Um, they're entangled in lost fishing gear that have long ropes that can get tangled in there. And also they have, they can experience, you know, collisions with large ships. And this is uh, you know, like seabirds, this is one kind of stress that we can control. So this is a solution that we're working on. And I know these photos are kind of grim, but um, collisions are really the leading cause of death for whales in our waters, right? The leading cause, that's pretty striking and pretty sad. Um, but if you think about where we are and how much of, you know, if I look at this, how much comes to us, like how many things we need, they all come through shipping. You know, Oakland is the fifth busiest um, container port in the United States. Everything, you know, we both have in our homes probably came through the big Golden Gate, just like that. Um, so we, you know, we need shipping, but the solution here is really unprecedented. And I think it's a cool one, um, but it's, it's unprecedented collaboration, right? So the federal government is working together with industry and nonprofit organizations like us, the Greater Fairlands Association, and all of us are working together to reduce the speed of ships in areas where there are a lot of whales, right? You do, do the research, find out where the, whale, where the whales are, and then reduce speeds in places like the shipping channel that's in the sanctuary and right outside the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and slowing down is really safer for whales. So it's an amazing collaboration. Um, I'm really impressed by all that. I think it's a cool, cool example of people working together to, to you know, protect whales. And there's already a huge increase in the amount of co co uh, cooperation to slow down, right? So that's a pretty happy news. And you know, together, all these groups are working to reduce the primary stress stressor that's going to help our whale populations fully recover, as you were saying, because they're really important. Um, but you know, here we are. That was five stops, five solutions. You know, we took we took everyone on a tour of some of the most bountiful water in the whole world. And you know, we told you why it really needs attention. Um, so we've talked a lot about the ways we're working to help find solutions. And you know, one thing Sarah and I, you and I really talk about is how when you act climate smart, when you take climate smart actions, there is plenty of room for hope. And I think we've shown that today. That's right, Wendy, there's a lot of good we can still do and we know enough to act now. And also we can't afford to wait. The window for action is here and we're ready for it. And everyone that joined us tonight, we hope that you will all join us um, implementing this important work into the future. So thanks, Wendy and I really enjoyed this. Yes, definitely. We're having a little too much fun here. Too much fun, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will stick around and we can't wait to answer any questions you might have. Um, but first we have a quick word from Jeff who will pop back in. Great, thank you, Wendy and Sarah. That was fantastic. Before I say just a few final words, just everyone be sure to stay tuned for questions. Maybe we can run a little over to take some. I know a lot of good ones were coming in. I was reading them uh, during in the chat. 
So that was great. I'm excited about all these important projects we have underway. We can't do this without you, though. It's our community of ocean champions and supporters who both donate and put in time to help us. So, and not just help us, but to help the sanctuary. So if you're interested in supporting these projects, you can donate at farallons.org slash donate. We're ramping up our efforts for critical kelp forest recovery, protecting wells from ship strikes, bolstering coastal habitat, it's important for carbon sink, and so much more, and we need your help. You can find more information on how to volunteer by signing up for our newsletter to stay informed on upcoming opportunities. And you can do that at httpsfarallons.org slash subscribe. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Elaine to start the Q&A section. Thanks so much, and I appreciate your being here this evening. Hey, thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you, Sarah and Wendy. That was um, an amazing presentation. And I, I even learned a lot. Um, so, wow. And it just clearly shows just how much work we have going on here um, in one snapshot. Um, so I know it's seven o'clock and I'm sure a lot of folks um, need to head off to dinner, um, get on with their evening. But if you want to stay for a few extra minutes, we'll do um, just a few questions. We have so many good ones coming in and we will compile those and answer them and send them out um, with those answers to everyone who attended today as well. Um, but one I, I just saw that I think is really interesting and something we didn't actually touch on is um, a question about ocean noise pollution. And so mm -hmm. is that something that's factoring in here? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and that's something that our whale conservation program is really looking into and considering. And also it's good to know that slower ships are quieter ships. So our efforts to work with the industry and with the sanctuary to slow those ships down will reduce the amount of noise pollution in the sanctuary. Um, but yeah, that's a big concern and something that we, we wanna put more effort towards. So great question. Great. Um, there was one way up at the top, and I'm not sure um, if you're still listening in, um, David Loeb, it looks like, but I just wanted to um, get to this question. It, it says, so for the kelp topic, um, how do the urchins survive if they um, eat through a lot of the bull kelp? Don't they reach a point where their population will plummet if their food source is decimated? Um, Sarah, is that a question that you have some insight into? Yeah, that's a really great question because as a marine ecologist, that is my first thought too. I'm like, right, they eat through all their food, population explosion, population crash. Something interesting I've learned about these urchins is that um, I've heard the term zombie urchins. They can actually persist out there in these really high concentrations in kind of like a state of torpor. Is that the right way to say that word, torpor? Um, where they're basically starved and they have reduced metabolism and they're just kind of sitting and waiting for available food to present itself. So the unfortunate thing is that in order for the bull kelp to come back, it needs to be able to grow from the microscopic scores, spores into little baby kelps. And they can't do that if there's always urchins there just waiting to mow them down once there's food available. So um, yeah, great question. And you know, this, this, these urchin barrens are of unprecedented scale, um, something we've not seen on the coast. So we are still kind of learning about the dynamics of this. Great, thank you. Um, and then a question that came in as we were um, talking about uh, sand and sediment. Um, just how do you how do you match that sand and the you know the dating app that, um, that we're creating? How do you match that sand? Got it. Good, good question. And it's not using Tinder, um, but we did spend a little too much time thinking about that um, dating app analogy and it is an appropriate one. Um, you know, you have to think about matchmaking. Uh, number one, you have to think about integrity of the sand, integrity of people, integrity of sand. Um, you can't have toxic people or toxic sand, right? So you need clean sand. Number one, it can't be polluted. Um, you have to have clean sand. Number two, it has to be compatible with the place you're putting it. So you can't put mud on a sandy beach and vice versa, it doesn't work. Um, just like people, you have to have compatibility. Um, and that's where my dating analogy runs out. But, um, you know, it's about really thinking about right now is matchmaking the people, you know, who's going to have sand, who needs it, what's the timing, how are we going to work it out, how are we going to get there, who is, who are the players, and, you know, that's really the piece, we need someone to do the legwork, and that person can be us, so 
think it's a really exciting thing to be working on. Yeah, I think so too. It's really interesting. You've taught us so much about sand and sediment here in the association and the sanctuary. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna just do one more and this is one that um, I think I can um, answer. Uh, just it's about you know volunteer opportunities. Um, what are they? We talked a little bit about volunteer opportunities at Bellinas Lagoon and I just wanna let everyone know if you're still tuning in um, head to our website, fairlawns.org, and there are upcoming opportunities when we get back in person um, to get out at Bellinas Lagoon and help us remove invasive species um, to ensure that that natural wetland habitat um, is restored and uh, continues to be um, healthy and thriving. And then we have other opportunities at our Aquarium Visitor Center with our education department and um, with our beach watch program, which monitors the coastline for uh, marine mammal and seabird presence. So there really are a lot of opportunities. And um, as we look to the near future, getting back out there, we do hope you can all join us um, in these efforts. Um, and with that, it's um, 7.05. So um, I just wanna say again, thank you so much to Sarah and Wendy. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us today. Um, and for everyone who attended, um, we hope you learned some interesting facts and um, we hope to um, connect with you all soon. So with that, everyone have a great night. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great one. Bye. -bye.